This program review is, in, is at least in part, um, a bureaucratic or administrative process. We are hoping through the reforms to program review that it's something more than that, but that is part of what it is. And part of what program review is about is finding ways for departments, units, groups of departments, an entire division, an entire college to speak um, to the campus and to those that make decisions on behalf of the campus. So we're very pleased to have some of those decision makers with us. Um, we, uh, we had invited the, an additional member, the, uh, one of the associate deans from the College of Music who then had to go to town, but Dan Shirley slip in and join up here. But we do have uh, William Comfort, the vice provost, who's also chair of the campus budget committee, Graham Adi, associate dean of arts and uh, humanities that we've already uh, heard from earlier, John Stevenson, who's the associate dean of the graduate school, and again, one of our number, and then Michael Zimmerman, uh, the director of the Center for the Humanities and Arts. So they're going to say a few words of wisdom, and then we'll open it up to talk about how we talk to them. Thank you. <laughs> well, I was on the list first, so I guess I'll, I'll talk first. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here and, and engaging in this, in this conversation. I'm sure the, the, uh, the Provost De Stefano would also love to be here today. But he's having an institute experience in Italy this week. He's, he's on a two-week vacation. And uh, so uh, for this week, I'm the, uh, the acting provost. And you can see how the market has reacted to that. <laughs> but, but, but just wait. Next week, Jeff will be the acting provost. <laughs> so so th things, things will, in fact, in fact be different. Um, looking out there, I don't, I don't see my, uh, my friend and colleague Andy Cowell out, out in the audience. That, that permits me to talk about him, I guess. Um, you know, Andy, Andy is, is someone that, uh, that I greatly admire in that he is uh, a professor on this campus who has published in scholarly journals, in the humanities, in the social sciences, and in the natural sciences. And that, to me, I think is a, is a, is a tremendous accomplishment to, to be able to have something to say across the board in that way. And it's, it's, it's in some sense that, that even if we're only talking in a narrow sphere, we should be uh, motivated to have that kind of ability to, to, to interact. I think this is something very similar to what Martha was saying uh, earlier this morning about, about th that, that uh, important breadth and, and I think that, that in the humanities, it's, it's perhaps easiest to start on, on that, kind of, that kind of path. But that, that really interrelates to what I want to say about, about uh, where Jeff was leading us in, in that, to get back to a little bit more of the, of, the, of the practicality of these issues. What can the arts and humanities uh, uh, do as they go through a review process? as they compete in a university uh, whole circle of the university for the scarce resources that are out there in, in trying to, to manage our, our enterprise. How can they help the university in, deliver, in delivering the university's, the university's business? And that's, that's uh, sort of my point of departure here. If you, if you think about what the university's business is, I think we could, we could probably, with uh, 80 or so people in the room, come up with 80 different definitions of what that, what that might be. But it would largely uh, involve things like, like learning, creating knowledge, uh, education, uh, moving on some sort of mission defined for us by, by uh, uh, those who are responsible for our very existence, uh, the, the students, the state, and so forth. And, and essentially what that means is that we're in place to be producing the very things that, that are quite simply in our contracts to produce, teaching and service and research. That, that's our job, is to produce, produce those things. But I think that in the, in the context of, of delivering those things, there, there tends at times to be in certain parts of, of, of the campus and perhaps mainly in, in the uh, mainly but not exclusively in, in, the, uh, in the humanities and the creative arts, some kind of feeling 
of, of what uh, Dean Gleason refers to as administrative itis. And that is that the only thing that's important at the top and in this process of, of decision making about the allocation of resources are those things that are new or innovative or bold or sexy. And I would have to say, from my experience, that's, that's definitely not the case. That there is a real interest in, uh, throughout the university, throughout the administrative structure, in, in seeing excellence grow, seeing, seeing growth in all areas in which we are delivering our, our mission. Now, now the problem is, how do you express what's, what's going on? How do you express your uh, very great capacity to be delivering uh, to that mission? And it's really uh, an issue of being persuasive in the arguments you put forth uh, about what you're doing. Last year, as, as part of the, the budget process, I, 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 I took upon myself the exercise of, of in some really, I'm glad Dean Scher is here now to, to hear this point, of, of, of uh, uh, making some, <laughs> making, uh, trying to put down in paper for myself, first off, and then also for my committee, the Academic Affairs Budget Advisory Committee, and then also for the provost, some, some kind of way of looking at how different units do the same thing differently. That same thing is delivering our mission, but it's, it's done in, 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 in different kinds of ways. And as a social scientist, I, I use the, the meager tools available to me and, and drew up uh, what, what if, you, if you ever had an introductory uh, economics course, you would recognize as a production possibilities curve. And I said, as, as units, we're trying to deliver teaching and research. And so I tried to come up with, with measures of, of that. And um, using the, the data that we had at hand, so for instance, from our uh, institutional uh, relations department and also from uh, faculty affairs, I had data on what we teach and what we produce as far as scholarly and creative works are concerned. And I ended up being able to, to sort of draw the frontier of the campus. Who is out on the edge in terms of the units that we're, that we're producing? That, that, uh, those units I'm talking about were uh, basically uh, uh, the, the six schools and colleges on campus with uh, instructional programs uh, plus arts and sciences divided into its three uh, large components. And so when I, when I, when I uh, drew this, uh, this frontier of, of, of activity toward meeting our mission, what I ended up with was at one extreme, the extreme where the faculty were teaching an awful lot, primarily because it's fairly cheap to deliver that teaching mission, but didn't have all that much research on a per faculty nature, was the collection of the social scientists. Uh, as, I, as I went up this, 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 uh, this, this graph, and remember I had to then have some sort of measure of research productivity, and what I did was the broadest measure I could take from purpose, including all the little categories, numerical categories that you check things off on in your annual review. As I went up that list, I got to the natural sciences with their combination of somewhat less teaching per faculty member in terms of student credit hour production, but a higher measure of this research. And then I got to engineering. And when I got to the end, there was the College of Music because I was including creative uh, works. I was including performances in this major, and they excelled. And they're part of that frontier. Well, as, as, as a challenge, it's your challenge to, to, ex to, to describe in, in every case how you're on that frontier, how your, uh, your outputs, your, your productivity, the things you are doing are pushing that frontier out. So I'll hear what the, the other three administrators uh, say and, and uh, uh, be thankful for the fact that the tomatoes haven't been broken out yet. <laughs> I hope I won't speak too long. I feel like I've had a, a sizable bite at the cherry. So, um, <laughs> um, just maybe three things. Firstly, I was struck when I 
came into the Dean's office um, six years ago, and it took me about three years to, to actually not only be struck by this, but to start thinking that we ought to behave differently. I was struck by the fact that humanists very rarely ever ask for anything. Almost never. We've got used to not getting anything, and we don't ask. Um, you know, a humanist will get a job offer somewhere else, and they'll come and say, maybe, maybe I could have a few thousand dollars more in salary. A scientist will get a job offer somewhere else, and they'll come back and say to the provost, I want 20 lines. I'm not going to stay here unless you give me 20 lines to start a new initiative. <laughs> and, and the provost will demur and say, no, maybe I'll only give you 10. Um, so one thing is, we've got to ask for more, we've got to be more aggressive about it. Secondly, we've got to point out to the university again and again and again that we generate an awful lot of money in this university. Always, um, the, the, the university has a tendency to look at not the dollars that they can be guaranteed to get, which are the tuition dollars, but the extra dollars that they will get from research grants, which are variable and transient and fragile. But there is this number of dollars that they get from our students. We teach an awful lot of students, which is, which just, is, which is just guaranteed. So they don't really have to take any notice of us because they know they're going to get those dollars willy-nilly. Those students are going to turn up at the door and they're going to pay their tuition and the university is going to have that dollars. But on the other hand, the scientist says, you know, I might have a grant of $20 million if I do this, then you know, the, the university starts salivating because that's an extra $20 million that they weren't actually guaranteed before. So I think we've got to demand more of the dollars that we actually generate. I, I did a calculation a few years ago and um, and in the Division of Arts and Humanities, it was about a two and a half to one ratio between the dollars that we generate and the direct costs. And, uh, now, of course, there are indirect costs, so that's not the total cost of the, of the uh, operation. But I think we don't demand enough and that we actually do generate a lot. Finally, I think I'd like to stress the point uh, that the number of people who have made, like George um, and David and a number of others, we've got to be able to talk clearly and intelligibly, intelligibly to people and succinctly. We tend to go on too long, we, we have a great love of jargon, and whenever we give a talk, we speak from notes. If you go to a, sign, a scientific presentation, they never have notes. They know what they're talking about. The, I, I come from New Zealand, and the indigenous people of Maori there say, you know, if a man comes up, or a woman, well, they don't often women speak unfortunately, but if a man comes up and gives a talk from notes, you can be sure he's lying. <laughs> so, you know, I think we should, you know, and, and, and the point is that, you know, if you go to talk from notes, and I realise I had some before, if you go to talk, you go to talk from notes, it's clear that somehow or other, I mean, it, it just gives the impression that somehow or other, this isn't really you speaking, it's something else. And uh, people can't follow it, it doesn't sound honest, and we've got to get over it. So that's my injunction to all us humanists. Dump the notes. <laughs>
get people in a room and watch them watch Chris Brader talk about a painting, I, I think we would probably be better off than trying to say why what Chris was doing with that painting was valuable. And that's something I think we need to, to struggle with, why it is that what we do seems so important and good to us as we're doing it and to our students as they watch us do it as, and as we engage them in, do it, in doing that kind of activity and, and why that seems difficult to extrapolate from it and deliver to a larger audience. I am assist, associate dean, I just gave myself a demotion there, I, I am associate dean in the graduate school. I want to talk to you for just a minute about where graduate education might figure into your strategic planning exercises and, and into the, the plan for the arts and humanities as a whole. Um, it's been said a couple of times today and I think needs to be reiterated that this campus is a comprehensive research university and part of its mission is to deliver a range of quality graduate programs across the disciplines, that it is fundamental to our identity here as a flagship institution, that we will offer graduate degrees in which students are trained in research methods across all of our disciplines. I, I think in trying to articulate what it is that we should be doing as a set of disciplines, I think we need to remember that our graduate education mission is fundamental to who we are. Um, Todd did talk about that a little bit in, in his preludial comments, Lo, these many hours ago, and I realize some of you weren't here to, to hear that. Um, but I think a serious look at your graduate programs, how they stand now, where they might go, I, I think that that's <coughs> something that everybody needs to put into um, their reports and into the general conversations that, that we engage in as, as a set of related disciplines undergoing program review this year. Um, I think that the climate may be improving for new resources in graduate education on campus, and so I think it's important to ask for new things, picking up on, on, on what Graham said, ask for more support. Try to say that this is fundamental to what you're doing as a discipline, and that the campus has to recognize that, that fundamental part of what you're doing is a part of the fundamental identity of, of this campus. So I would urge you to do that. You also have an advantage, and, and I, I think that you might strategize this in some ways. Unlike, say, our friends in the sciences or engineering, where the idea that a graduate student might pay any money for his or her education is as foreign as the notion of a non-carbon-based life form, um, I, we have lots of students who, I wouldn't say cheerfully, but nonetheless do pay for the graduate education that they're receiving, particularly at the, at the master's degree. I think that the campus would like to encourage more of that. And I think insofar as a lot of our programs have been able to achieve that more or less inadvertently, um, that if you can figure out ways to make that work better for your programs, including thinking about ways to engage in revenue sharing with Central Campus, get some of that money that, that people are paying at the graduate level in tuition to be part of your program, send it back to your programs that you can use, say, to support your PhD programs. I, I, I think the campus as a central body needs to hear those ideas coming from you, and, and I would commend that idea to you. So that's a very practical suggestion. I, I, I will then make one more point and, and then I'll shut up. Um, I do think the fundamental issue that's, that's been identified here today about how do we talk about ourselves to others is, is crucial. But there's a way in which I think the more important question than how do we talk to external audiences is how do we talk to other groups on campus. Uh, in some ways the friends we have outside of, of campus already exist. We know who, we, who they are. We are already communicating with them, often quite successfully. I think there are book readers out there, there are literature lovers out there, there are music lovers and art lovers, there are history lovers. Those people are out there and, and we can connect with them. In some ways, I think the harder audience, and, and Bill and Graham were both touching on this, 
are our other colleagues on campus, people working in other disciplines. And I think in order to compete successfully in, in what is a resource-scarce environment on this campus, we need to be able to articulate what it is that we do and why it's valuable to our colleagues, not just in the social sciences where, where we have some natural affinities, but to, to more distant bodies in, in the natural sciences and, and in engineering. Um, and, and that's not easy to do. Universities are really curious collocations of interest. I mean, there are warring factions, there are mutual hostilities and suspicions that it, it, at times remind me of, of entities as improbable as the former Yugoslavia, or <laughs> perhaps the present-day United States, I, I, I don't know. And, and so we, we, we need to find ways to talk across the disciplines. And, and I think Bill touched on this really effectively. And at some point, in some ways, what I want to do is just underline what he said. I think that what we need to do is to show how the teaching and research that we do is in some ways aligned with their own teaching and research missions. It, we do different things. We talk in different ways. We have different objects of study. But our priorities and our values are still about knowledge, about discovery, about education. Um, I, I do think we're sometimes at a disadvantage because there is a kind of, both a perception and a reality that what is new is what is truly valuable and therefore what is valued on this campus. But I, I guess, and this, this will be my final point, I think if we focus on the issue of discovery, I, I think that that gives us some some both rhetorical and substantive advantages. And, and, and I have discovery in two senses in mind. One is the kind of discovery that goes on in, in the classroom with our students. And I think this goes on across all disciplines, in the sciences and, and, as well as in the humanities. Um, and that's the experience I had as an undergraduate when I discovered the poetry of William Butler Yeats. I mean, this is a discovery that thousands, millions of people have made before. I wasn't discovering new knowledge, but I was discovering a piece of knowledge, a piece of art, a body of art, that was incredibly important, not just to me, but to others. And I therefore entered into a, a community of discovery that was taking place in the past, taking place in the present, and will go on for a very, very long time. I hope forever. So there's that kind of discovery. The discovery an individual makes that's a discovery that others have made that brings you into a community of, of learners. So I think across campus we share that, that love of discovery that takes place in, in, in the classroom. But there's also the discovery of new knowledge that, that we make. And I think that it's not the kind of iPod technology that, that Graham was talking about earlier. But Going back to something else that Graham talked about earlier when he talked about our colleagues in physics, uh, Lyman and Cornell discovering something weird about the, the nature of matter. Matter is something that's been around for a long time, right? Scientists have known about matter, they've known about atoms. But there's new stuff to be found out about atoms all the time. We haven't gotten to the bottom of the atom yet. In the same way, we haven't gotten to the bottom of King Lear yet. We haven't gotten to the bottom of Leonardo da Vinci yet. There's always something new to discover in the greatest achievements of, of the human mind. And I think we need to make it clear to our colleagues across campus that when we produce new knowledge, it's new knowledge in much the same way as they're producing new knowledge as well. So I, I would leave you with that. Good luck. Start by thanking Jeffrey Cox for uh, and Andre for helping put this together. We give them. <laughs> important intervention, and I hope it has uh, uh, far-reaching consequences. First of all, I'd like to uh, just to uh, address what John was saying. In the, the German world, uh, they have one word for science, Wissenschaft, but there's two kinds. There's Naturwissenschaft, what we call uh, natural science, and there's Geistes Wissenschaft, which is what we call the humanities. So there's only one word for a rigorous inquiry. It's all of it science. 
All of us do science in the sense of our own form of rigorous inquiry. Whether we're artists, whether we're people in what are called the humanities, whether we're social and natural sciences. And I think the, the pro part of our problem is a discourse problem, a definitional problem. Science is viewed as something uh, technically exact and rigorous. What we do isn't uh, regarded in that way. And I think that's just a uh, failure to apprehend what we do, a failure to communicate what we do effectively. Uh, because I think we engage in various rigorous inquiry uh, of, of our own kinds. But I want to spend just a second on a little just so story. Uh, once upon a time, there were no iPhones, there were no text message devices, there were no cheap phone calls, no fax machines, no emails, no World Wide Web, only snail mail and Ma Bell at $5 a minute. This is true back when I was a graduate student in the 1920s. <laughs> now, things have changed. We are living on the tip of a digital tsunami that we're only beginning to get the effects of. And part of what we in the, human, in the humanities and arts need to get are the consequences that this tsunami has for us, both good and ill. I think, for example, of uh, what Nietzsche had to say in the, I'm teaching Nietzsche this semester. He wrote a wonderful essay called The Uses and Abuses, or Uses and Disadvantages of History for Life. And one of the things he talked about was the importance of, in the process of learning to become a focused creative person, to draw a horizon around yourself within which your energies can become focused and not deprived of that focus by this constant bombardment of external stimuli, <coughs> references to historical times and places far beyond yours. So I think in the pedagogical context in which we operate, in which our students are completely outfitted with all those things I just mentioned, all the time. <coughs> now it's bad enough when I was an undergraduate, where all I had to worry about is distractions for sex and fear, and much more of the latter. But they, they've got that, those two plus all the other things, I think. <laughs> and it is a problem pedagogically for us. How can learning take place in this context? Moreover, how can we do research in this context? How many of you feel good about yourself when you can conduct a 20-minute focused bit of work at your desk without going to email and finding yourself swamped for 45 minutes having to deal with a bunch of income? <laughs> This was not the case when I was a young professor. It was different. It was better. <laughs> I could spend three hours in a row, even four hours, with no interruption. It, it was great. Now, of course, there have been many advantages. I don't have to go to the library anymore, except when I need a book I actually need to get. Because I can sit there with JSTOR and all these other fantastic things that library communities have made available to us and just download my research right at the desk. And it's fantastic. So that, that's, that's a good thing. But this, the, 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 it's a mixed bag that we're faced with. I don't have a solution to it. But I think there's something we need to think about. Now, another thing I think that is important, I'm looking at my notes now because I'm about to tell a lie about that. <laughs> <laughs> Consider the other change that's happened. The power of digital media has created 110 million active bloggers. Now that's a lot of blogging going on. Now this is the new context in which the public has become the author. <coughs> the text has gotten away from us. We used to have a set of canonical texts and we added to them multiculturally. Or we should bring in what people 300 years ago from this community wrote or contemporary community put in print or whatever. This is the tip of the iceberg compared with the text being generated all over the world by a lot of <coughs> actually very interesting and competent people. How do we in the humanities and arts address that? That phenomenon? How do we get our arms around that? Are we even bothering to think about it as a field of research or study? And what are the implications of it? The, act, the activation of <coughs> the public as its own producers of knowledge and information. This is a big change, one that we need to think about. What about the production of multiplayer games, such as Second Life, 
the whole digital, I mean, I have a hard enough time in my first life. The prospect of getting into second, third life, whatever these things are, is daunting to me. But people live in these worlds. What are they about? What kinds of shifts in subjectivity, opportunities for reconceiving the human and so on, are taking place in these domains? Ought we not to be studying this? These are major seismic shifts in our culture, which have huge implications for our self-understanding and for the ways in which we're going to be conducting ourselves in our lives in coming decades, because this will only get more intense, more seamless, more realistic, more seductive, and more powerful. Now, I love books. I love how they feel. I love to handle them, and I love paper. I love all that stuff. This is what I was raised in. But the book is an old and technology which will always be with us, but new stuff's coming down the road. In fact, I noticed that Diane, Diane Seaver here has just bought your first, what do you call those? A e book? Kindle. Kindle. I mean, I was admiring it. I like it. It looks good. But this is, again, part of what it seems to me we need to be doing is to ask artists and humanists at this moment, we need to be paying attention to this as well as to what we also do, which is to transmit knowledge. I love what John was saying about every 19-year-old every who, who discovers the age. It's brand new. It's happened for the first time. But at the same time, we have to find ways to get ourselves in touch with what's happening in the broader culture. In terms, because there are people are way down the road from us, uh, in typically, in what they're doing. Uh, and a lot, of it's, a lot of it's not all that interesting. Some of it's very powerful. How can we help integrate that into what we're up to? This is, I think, a big challenge for us. Now, there's a couple of other things I wanted to mention. One of the opportunities that the new digital media have made possible is a compilation and distribution of text and images in a way that's never before been possible. And I'm working with Jim Williams and a number of other people on something called Project Bamboo, started at the University of Chicago, which is an effort over a period of 18 months to have several strategic meetings where uh, members of faculty and the instructional technology and libraries are meeting to carry out various projects designed to help them get on board the process of gathering, digitize, digitizing, disseminating, and making easily accessible the tremendous amount of material that are in our own archives that just currently languishing here. Like, I mean, Jim could tell you in our special collections, we just have hundreds of thousands of pages of images and whatnot that, that we, we don't, no one can get to. So part of what the University of Colorado ought to be considering doing is becoming involved in this project. We are taking that step. But this is one of the things that is going to eventually come, come up with this kind of question. How will this work be rewarded? What are going to be the incentives for faculty and graduate students to become involved in this type of what amounts to a kind of inquiry, a methodology of making this editorial decisions, how to make this, this material available, how to schematize it. So these are things we have to think about as a faculty. Can we find a way to make this work valuable in terms of promotion and tenure in a way that we can take seriously? And what will that look like? And what kind of process will we have to go through in order to achieve that? Because that's one of the opportunities we have. And something we ought to be doing. We ought to be doing this. Given the tools at our disposal, we should make the knowledge that we have accumulated, the documents and images we've accumulated over the centuries, available to the widest possible public. And we shouldn't wait for Microsoft to do it. We should be doing it. How do we do it? Finally, I, in terms of interdisciplinarity, which has been talked about today, I'm, I'm fascinated by this whole topic. Uh, I mentioned Diane, Diane Seaver, and Rebecca West and I, uh, Rebecca's with Atlas. We've, we, won a, we were fortunate enough to win one of the C grants that the graduate school, uh, Dean Graduate School put forth last year. We're going to start next fall uh, a new seminar for faculty and graduate students called Visual Arts, Visual Science. And we're going to bring faculty and grad students from arts and humanities and engineering and social sciences together every Thursday in the fall and for the following fall to work on how they can understand more deeply what they themselves do by delving into and becoming acquainted with the work that people from other disciplines do, often with the same technology. One of the interesting, and I like what Michael Theodore said earlier too, you know, that you get this free. A uh, bonus once you digitize. There's a whole new realm of, of activity and possibility that aren't possible without it. So we're hoping to help start a conversation on the part of our faculty and graduate students about how can we learn from each other 
about the power of how, for example, someone in physics can represent something visually or in biology, and how this can be interpreted politically, culturally, aesthetically by someone from our side, and vice versa. Also, for example, the images that artists, contemporary artists, can create using digital technology of all kinds. How can this help shed light um, for the scientists about the aesthetic impact of what they do? And so on. So we're hoping to create a, a collaboratory, as it were, which will eventually uh, issue forth in uh, collaborative grant applications and all kinds of creative activities. There's nothing like this on this campus yet, but given the strength of our arts and humanities faculty and the strength of the sciences and engineering here, we ought to be doing this. This is something where we can learn, where a, a domain in which we can and should be learning from one another. And I hope that this will uh, bear a lot of fruit. But I, I just want to close with uh, uh, the observation I was making a, a while ago to myself. You know, when you reach my age, I'm practically the oldest person in the room. This is for me a really interesting realization. Because, it, uh, because what it allows me to do at this, this point in my life is see 40 years. So I'm 62, so I remember when I was, I was 22, just coming out of college. So I see these four decades, and I have seen the change in four decades. This is real different than 1968 uh, was. Very different. And 30 years from now, this, this whole 2030, we should probably talk about 2038, it's going to be really different from now because the intensity of the developments that are going to be coming online in terms of the technologies that are going to transform our lives are, we, cannot, we, can, we can't even anticipate the consequences. But right now we should at least become up to speed on raising the question, how are we going to respond? How can we get ahead of the curve? How can we make the University of Colorado, especially in arts and humanities, which is our world, effective, powerful players in these new technologies in a way that supports us, supports our pedagogy, supports our research, and supports our mission? I think this is a central topic that we really need to pay attention to. Thank you. to John Stevenson. I loved your pep talk about discovery and how you dig into Lear deeper and deeper every century. Um, just want to point out that uh, we are constrained, both humanists as well as social scientists, to some degree by the channels by which our discoveries and, and, uh, and our work gets disseminated to the broader public. And I'm thinking particularly of our own campus organ, the Silver and Gold Record, which always has on page three or four, this uh, spiral bound notebook logo thing, and it's called Research Notes. Yeah. And I've been watching Research Notes yeah. regularly, and uh, there's never anything from, any, from a humanistic <coughs> field. There's never anything from social science. I'm an anthropologist. I'm waiting for that, too. So research is hard science, and I think the word discovery probably is hard science. And we're stuck with the category of scholarship which somehow is not thought to be anything new. It's reworking the old somehow. Anyway, I just hope maybe breaking that sort of, those categories and using a different um, vocabulary to represent our work might get us a bit more attention. Actually, if I could speak. Um, I'm an outsider. I work at LASP, which is on the East Campus, um, but I consider myself a humanist. <laughs> Anyway, um, I was just part of a negotiation team where we brought in $92 million to do some Sun-Earth Connection research. And, um, you know, I'm, I keep thinking, um, I'm, I guess I'm concerned that the, the university could be tempted to try to quantify, um, in a sense, how much research is done by uh, looking at the Office of Contracts and Grants um, data that shows uh, certain departments bring in this amount of money. And the implication is, is that research isn't taking place. But in fact, um, people don't need teams to do their work ne uh, necessarily. They don't need maybe more than an airplane ticket or some art supplies or maybe um, an opportunity to perform in a particular venue. Um, and you compare that to, you know, a program where you're going to be building spacecraft between now and 2029, 
Um, what's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see what the comparison is, and yet the temptation, perhaps by um, uh, people who are overly quantitative in their approach to um, numbers, um, would want to sort of say, well, there's no research taking place just because the numbers don't show that we're bringing in that kind of money. I just want to reiterate that we are bringing in that kind of money. <laughs> We're bringing in that kind of money every year, year after year, hundreds of millions of dollars. Students pay hundreds of millions of dollars, and it's well established in this university that the research grants don't actually pay for the research. The teaching mission of the university subsidizes the scientific research. So this is a, this is a very effective um, you know, narrative that has been has dominated this university for far too long, that the sciences make money, the humanities don't. It's false. It's wrong. Sorry, Meryl. Did you read that from your notes? <laughs> no, that was right from the heart. <laughs> I've enjoyed the presentation, uh, learned a lot, as usual, but, but I wanted to raise a little lighter subject, and that is the fate of humankind. <laughs> uh, for me, the arts and humanities have been out of play quite some time in terms of the public conversation, the public discourse. And there are some very, very different patterns of solving problems that you discover when you compare scientists and artists and humanists. One, for example, is that science tends to move from a generality to a specific, which is beautiful work. And artists and humanists tend to work from a specific to a generality. They have a capacity to symbolize problems, a capacity to speak in metaphor, and a capacity to create a form of discourse and conversation which, when properly applied, can explain very complicated problems. Social problems, scientific problems, humanistic problems, artistic problems, with great eloquence. But we are not at that table. We're not at that table of public discourse where we should be and need to be. If we focus on anything in the arts and humanities in the next few years, I want to see us look at strategies whereby we and the faculty can move into public discourse and present our ways of helping to solve the problems alongside of people in the sciences and the social sciences. Because we all have to be at the table. The questions are too critical and too dangerous not to be there now. We were the ones who helped bring about the world as it states today and stands today. We need to help fix it. And that's all I have to say. I've been thinking all along about how different this gathering would have been, let's, let's pick a day, 25 years ago, uh, conveniently just before I started graduate school. Uh, uh, we would have been talking about a crisis in the humanities, I think. We would have been talking about a crisis caused by the entry of theory into literary studies. What would that mean for history? What would that mean for classics? What would that mean for the, for the various humanistic disciplines? We don't have a crisis anymore. We're doing great work, and we seem really happy about it. We're doing work across the disciplines. We're doing interdisciplinary works within units. I think uh, talking to my fellow chairs, we've all been pleased and surprised to hear how interdisciplinary each of our unit is, not even counting what we're doing amongst each other. What we have a crisis of, I think we've defined today, is of communicating to the larger public, whether that larger public is the world outside, or, I think more pertinently, the administration within our university. Now, I'm going to steal a line from John Slater, who I think isn't here, but he was saying earlier, if we can't solve that problem of communicating what we do, we ought to pick up our bags and go home. We have to be able to do this. It's what we do for a living. We talk, we write things down. We make artistic shapes that say what we mean. So let's do it. Uh, I'm not a professional member of the university in any respect, and I'm curious what is the mission of the university and to what extent have the comments that have been made conforming to that mission or are there discussions and conversation about how that mission might be uh, amended, so to speak, uh, 
to speak to some of the concerns that have been expressed today. Anyone recite the mission statement? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I pledge allegiance yes, to serve Colorado, uh, lead the world. Uh, but uh, there is a, a mission that's written into state law that says that we are a comprehensive graduate research institution. And it, it may be slightly elaborated on that, but not much. Jim, you may. You may know what the uh, what that sentence is. You, <laughs> you I mean, is there something that the university itself can say to be more to flesh out more uh, of what they would perceive as what what they want to achieve and what and how they distinguish themselves as an institution? I think that statement has been made many times um, in either smaller or, or larger compass. Uh, it's part of what lay behind the the recent strategic planning exercise that we've been going in flagship 2030 and if, if you're curious you can go to the university website and, and there's a very it, it exists in several iterations but there's a, a fairly brief compass that does state what it is we think we are and where we think we're going and, and I think a lot of what we said on this last panel was specifically addressed to that and, and I think everything that people have been saying all afternoon has, has been attached to those ideas, which is that we're an educational institution for the state of Colorado and the country and the world, that we teach students and we produce new knowledge. Um, it, it doesn't, I mean, going back to Dennis's point, I, I think we don't often highlight enough that and this is another way maybe of saying what I said earlier, that, that there is new knowledge, but there's also the, the preservation of knowledge that I think is fundamental to our mission, particularly in, in our units. And I think that, that the preservation mission is neither simple nor passive. It's, it's an incredibly difficult and active job, and I, I think it's something we all have to do. I, we, we've made fun at various times today of certain kinds of uh, jargon that, that creeps into how universities talk about themselves. And one phrase that particularly irritates me is, is the phrase, I don't know if you guys have noticed it, moving forward, various administrators. <laughs> Not that I know any, of course. Uh, we'll say about a particular problem or a particular issue, they'll say, well, moving forward. Often it's a way of hiding the fact that they're avoiding confronting some difficult issue that's either immediately occurring or, or just past. It's a way of sort of sweeping it under the rug, forgetting about it. Moving forward, uh, you know, we won't think about how we got into that much trouble. But I think a lot of what we do highlights the importance of both not moving forward and even moving backward that those are the places where reflection takes place. And reflection is itself its own kind of mm -hmm. discovery, it seems to me. The previous uh, uh, question before my, my question addressed the relationship of the university to the community at large. And I haven't heard you mention anything in the mission statement that would speak to that. And it, also we talked about, you know, civic virtue and, and values and many other aspects. I mean, the question isn't, do we educate? That's that's assumed that that's what colleges do. But educate about what? You know. So we try to educate everybody everywhere. <laughs> I'm going to have to put an end to this fascinating discussion. I want to thank all the panelists all day who have been. and not off in the Death Star that is uh, Rachel Paul. Um, you know, Catherine said, if, if we can't solve this communication problem, who will? And as you hear the intelligence and the energy and the passion and the wit of the speakers and the audience, it is, does seem to me a problem we can solve. If you want to know what's going to come out of this conversation, if you thought that there were issues that were raised from these conversations that you think should be addressed by the units under review, you should let us know. Andre and I will be generating some 
questions or issues of our own. We're not trying to overload units, but we're going to come up with some things out of this conversation to bring back uh, to the units to think about. Um, so there will be at some point a kind of closure to those questions, and the units will go ahead with their self-studies. In any event, we've talked about in situ learning today. I've always believed in in vino learning. <laughs> the bar is open. <laughs> <laughs>